Hello, everyone. Welcome. I'm Shelley Gunther, Clinical Marketing Manager here at Clarius. I'd like to welcome you to today's live educational webinar, the second of the year with our esteemed guest speakers, experts Dr. Cern Boyson and Dr. Serge Shaloub. Today's topic is dog versus car, veterinary focus in canine trauma, navigating respiratory distress. Today, we'll learn how POCUS can play a pivotal role in assessment and management of thoracic trauma patients. And before we start, I'd like to thank the Vet Show and NAVC for inviting you all to join us here today. You're among just over 3,000 veterinary medicine enthusiasts who registered for today's popular event. This webinar is race approved and thanks to the Vet Show. So please stay on for the full session to qualify for one CECPD credit. By participating for 50 minutes or longer, you'll receive an email from the Vet Show in the coming week to redeem your educational credit. Now, after the presentation, I'll do some live scanning with my dog, Mabel, here. And she's a five-year-old Wheaton Terrier. And at any time during the webinar, you can use the Q&A box at the bottom of your screen. And Drs. Boyson and Chaloub will be available to answer questions during the live Q&A session following the presentation. Now, let me now introduce our host. Dr. Frankel is trained in emergency medicine in California. A passionate focus educator, Dr. Frankel has been using point of care ultrasound his entire career. He practices in a busy academic teaching hospital here in Vancouver as an emergency medicine physician and serves as the chairman of our medical advisory board. Hi, Dr. Frankel. Hi, Shelley. Thanks for having me today. And uh, I love these talks where I'm invited to um, where the topic is really similar to what we do in the human world, but we get to explore the veterinary parallels. And to set the stage for today, uh, we're going to be talking about trauma and to kind of go beyond maybe what a lot of you have heard before and doing just abdominal exams, but really going into the thorax too. And there's a lot of robust literature from the human world, and we wanted to set the stage with some of the veterinary literature to kind of set how we're going to discuss uh, doing the scans and what we're going to find. The first one I wanted to review was this prospective cohort lung ultrasound study, where they found a really high sensitivity for the diagnosis of pulmonary contusion compared to what we know as the gold standard of thoracic CT scans in this population with motor vehicle trauma, showing that you can get really high quality information without the radiography and getting the patient to CT who's even potentially unstable. The other study I wanted to review was a group in Korea that was aiming to investigate the diagnostic accuracy of ultrasound and the detection of mild pneumothorax, again, using a gold standard of CT in dogs. As we know that small pneumothoraxes are not immediately life-threatening, but delayed diagnosis can cause disease associated with resultant compromise or collapse uh, as patients can become unstable. So it's really important to catch them early when possible. And this study showed that lung ultrasound, similar to the human population, uh, is much more sensitive than thoracic radiography for detecting these small pneumothoraces. And in particular, uh, there were specific signs that really helped seal the deal, giving it almost close to 100% specificity uh, on those findings. So before we dive into further details on how to bring ultrasound more into thoracic trauma, uh, we wanted to put this poll up to you. How often do you use ultrasound to assess trauma patients that you see? We know we have providers from across the world at various uses uh, in their integration of ultrasound into their practice. Uh, and where do you fall on this spectrum? Are you just learning something you do on a monthly basis, maybe weekly or daily? And since it's a single question, we'll close it out pretty quick, save some time for our speakers here. Great, and we'll see where we're at. Yeah, so really across the board, that's excellent. So we have a quarter of you just learning and maybe even almost a fifth of you using it daily. So thankfully we have speakers who really can uh, teach everyone from the first beginner to the masters themselves. Cern Poison is a professor in small animal emergency and critical care and Serge Shaloub is an associate professor of internal medicine, both in the faculty of veterinary medicine at the University of Calgary. They're deeply involved in clinical care and teaching both at Western Veterinary Specialist and Emergency Center and at the Care Center in Calgary, Alberta. They're internationally recognized lecturers and true experts in their fields, pioneering the use of veterinary focus across the clinical spectrum. And we're always so happy to have them as speakers. I'm going to hand it over to you guys, the dynamic duo. 
Thank you so very much, Aron. And welcome back, everyone. It's great to see a lot of people here. I'm Serge. And I'm CERN. And CERN, what are we going to be talking about today? So this is something we're going to come back and revisit uh, a case that we introduced uh, a couple of years ago on uh, one of our Clarius presentations. And a lot of questions came up with this. So we're just going to go back and we're going to review some of the uh, findings when it comes to trauma and looking into the thorax and expand on what we presented previously. So you can see the uh, presentation here was on March 2021. If you're interested, there's some uh, stuff in there you could go back and review, but we're going to expand on that today. And that is going to be thoracic trauma, dog versus car, respiratory distress. All right, well, let's go ahead as usual, start of a case, triage. Oh, I think half our audience, their ears just perked up. They're ready for <laughs> We have a two-year-old male neutered husky that was hit by a car, Kira. We have a heart rate, you know, it's 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 up there. Respirate also up there. You know, I'm I'm starting getting a little worried. Wait a minute, I'm I'm a little worried about this respiratory effort. We've got crackles on the left side, decreased right dorsal breath sound, CERN or on. I know you two get really excited about this, but I'm sorry. Do we really have to do another emergency triage case? I am not excited about this. Yeah, we what did we talk about previously? I think we threw the kidneys in there just to keep you happy. We did One a lecture. whole talk One on the kidneys. One talk. It just goes to show you the relevant importance of trauma compared to kidneys. It's five times more important. Mm -hmm. So we're going to talk about uh, our uh, presentation here. And what are we going to do here? So you're confused. My first question, let's break this down. Let's simplify it then, Dr. Schlup. Is our patient stable or unstable? Uh, the patient is unstable. And I just like to highlight how excited you are in this picture about anything unstable, crashing and burning, no matter what you are, what you're wearing that day, you're in there. I am trained to respond to emergencies. <laughs> so our patient's unstable. What are we going to do? We're going to put a point of care ultrasound evaluation. We're going to use that to assess this patient. So let's go through this in a bit more detail then. So hold on. Is trauma even something that, like seriously, do we have to talk about another trauma case? All right. So we're going to say our patient was unstable from a respiratory standpoint. Correct. What did you think about heart rate? Uh, that rate was pretty high. So could be also cardiovascularly unstable. Correct. Might be pain. Yes. Might have some trauma. So I'm bleeding somewhere. Yeah. So let's look at trauma in general and break this down. Okay. Trauma is common. It, it, if you look through the literature, it, most of this comes back to the 1970s. We've listed the uh, sources here. Mm -hmm. uh, comes back to the 70s. And if we look at the research, literature that's out there, we probably have 11 to 13% of our urban ER cases are trauma cases. So definitely not negligible. And most of the time, it's going to be blunt abdominal injuries. Yeah. So we look at the division of which uh, sites are injured. We see the blunt uh, abdominal injuries account for roughly 45% of those trauma patients. Yeah. And within that group of abdominal injury, how often will we see something like a hemoperitoneum? Probably about 28 to 45%. So pretty significant. Negative. Now, coming back to the urinary tract, you know, the most important system in the body. Look at that. Only 3%. Look at that resiliency. So the urinary tract system is the uh, probably second most common injury we'll see in the abdomen. But like everything, when it comes to the kidneys and urinary tract systems, it's a distant second, <laughs> or you could probably call it last. But we do see both hemoperitoneum in a high percentage of our patients, uh, and we will see urinary tract rupture in a significant number of our blunt abdominal trauma patients. So right. Things to be aware of. Fine. We got Kira that came in. Could yeah. we have a hemoabdomen? We sure can. Could we have a uroabdomen? We no. <laughs> yes. But now I got to ask you, Kira was also breathing fast and also had difficulty breathing. So let's talk about thoracic injuries. How common is that? All right. So this is, again, 50% of our trauma patients right. will come in with thoracic injury. Okay. And what are, if we see a patient comes in, we've got blunt thoracic injury or trauma. Mm -hmm. What do we think the most likely or the highest uh, incidence of pathology is? If we break this down again, looking at the literature that's out there, we've listed at the bottom. Pulmonary contusions, 58%. Big, that's biggest big cause one. probably of our thoracic trauma patients when it comes to blunt trauma. Which makes sense, right? That's bruising in the lungs, right? Bleeding within the lungs. That makes sense with a hit by car patient. We have pneumothorax that's pretty high up on the list, 47% as well. That is an interesting finding because again, we're going to talk about the challenging of diagnosing pneumothorax, but that is an interesting finding. What else we got? And then we have hemothorax. Again, this one is much less frequent than contusions or pneumothorax. And keep in mind, when we talk about hemothorax, these aren't these life-threatening mm -hmm. bleed out and no. die from a hemothorax. Most of our veterinary patients, when they get struck by uh, vehicles, they actually don't survive long enough if they have significant right. uh, intrathoracic arterial tears like yep. the uh, aorta or some of the bigger right. vessels. They tend to die on site before they reach the veterinary clinic. That's right. So but we will see hemothorax in 18%. <clears throat> These are the more stable ones with lower volume hemothoracy. That's right. Now, you know what was interesting to me is that rib fractures was only up to 14%. 
because I feel that in the times that I work ER, we do see a lot of rib fractures. So that's an interesting point. Maybe we're underdiagnosing them mm -hmm. with the diagnostic uh, modalities we're using. Or I will say, if you think about the rib cage of our canine and feline patients, they're pretty elastic. So it does take a fair bit of trauma to break those ribs. And if you look at the literature, it's 14% incidence following trauma. Now, what about diaphragmatic hernias? How common is that? So this actually, we see this more with blunt abdominal trauma than we yeah. do with blunt thoracic injury. Really? That makes yeah. sense. Okay. Yeah. And we'll see that. If you think about it, how often do we see it in our trauma patients? It's about 6%. So again, not negligible, but much, much lower in terms of what are the big things we worry about first and foremost, that might be life-threatening in our trauma patients. All right. Pulmonary contusions, pneumothorax, hemoabdomen, uh, and then hemothorax probably. You know, and thankfully, I haven't seen a lot of this complication, flail chest. The first time I saw that, I think I almost fainted. It's pretty traumatic to see the first time. Yes, and it is the nice thing about a flail chest. It's, it's by definition, you have to have a segment of the chest that moves in the opposite direction mm. to the rest of the thoracic wall. Mm. So when you breathe in, instead of the chest moving out, mm. the actual chest pulls in in the section of flail chest. So it's multiple rib fractures in adjacent ribs that cause a flail chest. And the nice thing about this is you can see this on physical exam. And that's you don't good. need diagnostic testing other than a good physical and observation to see that flail chest. All right. And then traumatic right atrial rupture, very, very rare. We can see that less than 0.01%, thankfully, because yes. that would be a very bad thing. Yes. So we have, uh, it is something that we always talk about, but the incidence of it is extremely low. And I think I've only seen two case reports in veterinary medicine of a traumatic right atrial rupture following trauma. So I got to ask you, what do we do next? Go get a cup of coffee. Do we do a rectal exam? Uh, let's, let's break it down again. I, I know as an internist, your, your mind's all over the place, but let me Not focus you. Here place. we go. One second. One Very second. focused. Is our patient stable or unstable? Unstable. And what do you think is some of the bigger issues that you have to worry about in our unstable patient? You're is saying. it uh, a straining to urinate problem? What is the more life-threatening injury in this patient? I think you're trying to say rectal exam is not a good idea at this time. Since our animals dysmic and tachymic, we may, may, maybe want to provide some oxygen. Okay, good place to start. Probably can't go wrong with that. And our patient, hit by car. Do you think we're in pain or do you think we're uh, happy running around? Go lucky. That doesn't sound like a trick question. No, I think we're in pain and also anxious. A lot All of these right. patients are working against us, especially the work of breathing. Absolutely. And it's hard. Some of our veterinary patients, you can't talk to them and calm them down as easily as some of our human counterparts. Yeah. So we're going to use analgesics for pain and we're going to use anxiolytics to decrease work of breathing and anxiety for yeah. sure. And then get some emergency database blood work. So here we have hematocrit, pretty normal. Total solids, yeah, maybe borderline low, normal. We have a BUN that's right in the middle, a glucose of 4.9, normal, lactate 3.5 indicating. It is elevated. We have hyperlactatemia, anything over two to two and a half, we worry about for sure. Three and a half. Now I'm thinking, hmm, do we have some perfusion issues or is this truly just related to stress right. and pain? Exactly. And then we have an SPO2 of 85%. Woohoo! That's awesome. 85%. If I had an 85% in school, CERN, wow, I'd be happy. All right. So unfortunately, 85%, relatively speaking, is not a good value for what we're oh. looking at here. Oh. So it might be good if you have that as a grade. I would have been impressed and happy if you'd done that as my uh, student. You, but I was your student. Some students are yeah. tougher to teach than others. Oh. Um, but 85% oh. when it comes to the pulse ox is not a good value. You want to see a minimum of 90, ideally higher than 93%. So 85%, what's that telling us when we get it that low? Uh, that it's not 90% that we have lung function problems. So we've got abnormal lung function. Therefore, it supports the history of respiratory distress, crackles, maybe decreased breath sound. So we have something right. going on for sure in the respiratory system. All right. So I have an ECG showing sinus tachycardiac and a systolic blood pressure of just 90. That's problematic, questionable. All right. So what I, I think we're trying to say what I think we're trying to say here, there's a big place room here is point of care ultrasound as part of our emergency database. Yeah, so this is something, if you go back 15 years ago, nobody included point of care ultrasound mm -hmm. on the veterinary side as part of that minimum emergency database when the patients first came in. So you're telling me at this point, I don't take 20 minutes, go see the owner, ask them questions, maybe go to the bathroom, get a coffee break, come back, get full permission to do point of care ultrasound, 
wait another, maybe see another case and then start pointing care ultrasound? This is an emergency database. This is cage side or patient side. This is something you can do instantly when that patient hits mm. the door. Okay. So we're going to talk then about the application of pointing care ultrasound in the emergency setting as part of that minimum emergency database. Okay. So I got to ask you, I see this and I'm like, uh, that's, that's very confusing. Where in the world do I start? What's the focus here? All right. It's a very, very good question. And we always going to say that no matter how you do this, you still have to use your brain. You're the clinician. You've got the probe. I mean, I can train anybody to put a probe on an animal, but you have to be able to interpret what you're looking at yes. and how to use that in clinical context. So this is why we say it's always patient-centered and targeted. So you've got to look at the patient. So look at our patient here. This is Kira. Yes. We've got lots of information. Where's our biggest problem that you're most worried about given this history? Well, the problem is the problem is that the probe is too cranial. The kidneys are just back there. No. So what is the problem that the we're lungs. worried about? All right, we're worried about the lungs, and maybe we talked about uroabner hemoabdomen. Yeah. yeah. So again, then, is this you brought up a good point? Are you gonna start with the kidneys, Dr. Shalou? No, it's a trauma patient. We want to be targeted to specifically what this patient is coming in for. Exactly. So I mean, there are indications where we may look at the urinary bladder for volume estimation or GI motility in this patient down the road but it's not something we worry about when it first hits the door yeah. coming in for trauma. But you know, it's a good point because a lot of people are naturally more comfortable looking at the abdomen, right? So often they start there, but I think it's important to realize that this patient is coming in dyspneic and tachypneic. We truly think the main problem is going to be in the lung or pleural space. We should start there, really emphasize that. All right, good point. So now we've talked about it's patient-centered, it's targeted. You got to consider the consider the history and the clinical findings. We use it very widely in trauma, lots yeah. of applications of trauma. How else might we use it? Well, very much so in triage, right? We're going to be talking about that, that this patient is coming in. We've already said, we're not going to do full physical exam. You've barred me from doing a rectal exam. We're going to do a triage point of care ultrasound. What in the world does that mean? Yeah. And if you look at it, we put two studies up here, the original, uh, point of care ultrasound uh, study that looked at trauma patients. Mm -hmm. And then we did a similar point of care ultrasound trauma, non-trauma patient assessment. That's so, right. And that falls under that triage. It's it's used not just for trauma, all triage patients. And this is when we're doing the triage. If my patient's unstable yep. and he's trying to die, yes. would you do a full physical exam? Would you include your rectal? Would you include the full assessment and orthopedic evaluation? Would you be checking the eyes with an ophthalmoscope? Hold on. Oran wrote me the answer to say, <laughs> no. All right, that's a good answer. At least you're listening to somebody, if not to me. So when we look at this, you're going to be doing a triage exam. It yes. is an abbreviated heart, brain, lungs. Is our patient stable or unstable? Same thing with point of care ultrasound. Use the minimum windows you can, find the problem, stabilize the patient, and then when he's more stable, you can come back and do a more complete evaluation. Well, that's interesting because we went from, I think, an original three T's as an idea, right? Especially when we're talking about fast exams to now the six T's of point of care ultrasound to include treatment, right? So interventional point of care ultrasound, let's say our dog had severe uh, pleural effusion. Well, we can use point of care ultrasound then to go ahead and guide that needle in there, do a thoracocentesis right there on the spot. And again, it highlights the fact that do you do thoracocentesis in every single patient? No. no. Again, we use point of care ultrasound differently depending on the clinical setting, the history and the findings in that patient. Right. How else can we use it? Well, if we find a problem, our patient comes in and he's got pulmonary contusions, he's got problems in the lung, he's got aspiration pneumonia, he's got fluid in the abdomen, we can track that pathology serially over time and see if it is resolving or progressing. So we can certainly use it to track our 100%, findings. 100%. You know, going back to that McMurray study, we think about those critically ill unstable, non-trauma patients, a congestive heart failure patient, right? And you can track your therapy of furosemide, see those decreasing B lines over time. I love that part of it, right? The serial exam really saves us bringing that patient to the x-ray table and stressing out. So how else can we use this? And then we do a total evaluation of the patient, a systemic evaluation. Again, comes in unstable, we're going to do triage point of care ultrasound. Mm -hmm. Once our patient's stable, we're going to want to look at everything. Or if our patient's transferred to us off the ER to the ICU service in the morning, we do a full evaluation of that patient. If it's stable, we're going to do a total systemic baseline patient evaluation. So there's our six T's, targeted, trauma, triage, treatment, tracking, and total, if you like the T's when it comes to point of care ultrasound. All right, so let's come back to Kira, right? We're going to do point of care ultrasound. We know we have a trauma patient here. Where do we want to start? Like, what questions are we asking here? All right, so I'm going to bring you back to where we were. You said our patient was unstable. Correct. And you were worried about two big things when we talked about unstable. What Correct. were they? 
Um, something going on in the lungs potentially, and potentially something going on in the abdomen. That's it. That's all, right? So where, where would you flip a coin? So this is an interesting question. It depends a bit on people's comfort, and it depends on what we think the more life-threatening injury is. Okay. In, uh, Kira. That so our lactate's high. Yes. So hyper hypoperfusion argues against good perfusion. So yep. maybe we've got blood loss somewhere. Maybe that's okay. a life-threatening problem. All right. We also have that respiratory distress. Could yeah. be a life-threatening problem. Okay. So the question becomes, where do you start? And this one here, I'm going to say... Often it's more black and white. Our patient's stable from a cardiovascular standpoint, but just respiratory stress, we're going to start with lungs. In this case, we've got two problems, respiratory stress and potential bleeding somewhere, which could be either into the thorax or the abdomen. So this one here, I could go either way, depending on comfort level. However, to me, the patient has a bigger problem with the respiratory stress. I'm more worried about that than I am right now about a hemoabdomen. I'd probably start with a pleural space in lungs. I, I hope, Oran, we're recording this, right? Because that was very much an internal medicine kind of answer. I don't think that's ever happened. Maybe that's I am that's rubbing off on you. It's my... like, no, surge, we're doing this. No, surge, we're doing this. Well, often it's black and white. So you're telling me you want to start with the abdomen? I think you said you want to start with the abdomen? No, I said Maybe? I would start with the pleural space. But okay, we can start with the abdomen. Yeah. I mean, it is a hemoabdomen. Potentially, it could be there. So Some confused. people are more comfortable looking at the abdomen and the thorax. So let's go ahead and start with the abdomen. I'm so now. confused. So okay. We so we did our five point abdominal point of care ultrasound, and we were negative for any pathology, especially fluid. All right. So we probably should have started so with the lungs. One. So you guessed wrong. I said we I'm, could start I'm, with the lungs. I'm pretty sure. Now, one key thing, though. Is that it for the abdomen? We forget about the abdomen and cure forever. No, and that's the other point. Our patient's cardiovascular unstable. Could it be analgesia that's going to solve that problem? Could it be anxiety that's causing the tachycardia? Mm -hmm. Or could we actually have an occult bleed somewhere that once we start resuscitating will become more obvious later? Right. So there's no way we're going to ignore the abdomen. We've assessed it. It's negative. It's not the biggest immediate problem, but we need to follow that serially because fluid can accumulate over time, particularly following fluid resuscitation. All right, let's bring it back. We have a dyspneic dog, right? We have blunt thoracic trauma. We're hit by a car. Let's bring it back to the main pathologies. We talked about pulmonary contusions being likely the most common one, potentially. What are we going to see here? Uh, this was actually, uh, Oren re referred to this earlier with that uh, study in dogs comparing uh, point of care ultrasound to CT for the presence of pulmonary contusions. And what do we see with pulmonary contusions? Uh, both that study and another study by Armin Easy demonstrated that we will see both beelines and lung consolidation mm -hmm. in our patients that come in with pulmonary contusions. So those are two things we're going to look for in this patient with respiratory stress. Do we have increased beelines and or do we have contusions that suggest we have potential uh, pulmonary contusions. Present. All right. And then with pneumothorax, we also have hemothorax. With pneumothorax, some of the things we're going to see is absent lung sliding. We're going to come back to that. Um, lung point being present as well and an abnormal curtain sign potentially. What about hemothorax? And in hemothorax, this one's simple. We're just looking for fluid between the chest wall and the lung. And we've talked about this previously. It's tougher to diagnose those smaller volume effusions in our veterinary patients than most people would expect. That's right. So I would suggest you relook back on some of the other talks we've done. If you're wondering how to find those smaller volume pleural effusions, we've talked about that previously. But that's one thing we will look for is that separation of the pleura by anechoic fluid suggesting hemothorax. Now, diaphragmaticurnia, pretty rare. We talked about that, but you might see abdominal organs, especially the liver, that's going to be cranial diaphragm. And finally... And then we've got rib fractures. Again, this is something we usually diagnose through a uh, detection of pain or flail chest. We may need radiographs. That's sort of been our reference clinical standard in veterinary medicine. But do we have a role of ultrasound mm. to find rib fractures in our veterinary patients? Mm. That's an interesting question. We're going to back to that. Stay tuned. Stay tuned. And flail chest is a beautiful ultrasound diagnosis. I'm sorry. If you need an ultrasound to diagnose flail chest, you need to go back to vet school, my friend. Well, some teachers weren't that good in vet school. I just want to say that. So, okay. So we've decided to start on the thorax. Great. Where in the world do we start on the thorax? Do we just decide one side? Is it based on a physical exam? Does Kira tell us where to start? Yeah. So if we looked at this, and again, I don't know if there's a definite uh, only one answer to this. Often there's more than one answer to these situations. But if I look at this and you tell me what you think the problem is, mm -hmm. we've ruled out an immediate life-threatening hemoabdomen. Yeah. We're worried about our patient now deteriorating from a thoracic injury following yep. this trauma. Mm -hmm. And we've got two things we've got. We've got crackles on the left side and we've got decreased breath sounds on the right side. Yep. Which side are you going to start with? Which one are you sort of more worried about, do you think? You know what? I mean, the crackles are likely contusions, yep. right? And probably not much I can do about that besides give the patient some oxygen. But if there's a pneumothorax, 
I can potentially treat that, especially if something that's going to be significant. Absolutely. So you got a more immediate interventional uh, uh, test or diagnostic yes. or therapeutic intervention you can take. So I would agree with you on that one. I actually will say I agree with you this time. This is recorded. That this I recorded. would that I would go after the right side first because it may have something we can immediately treat and improve patient care over the left side. We're going to check both, but I would start with the right. So let's talk about pneumothorax. This is a bit of a summary from before, but there are two main criteria that rule out pneumothorax at the probe location. What are they? And that is lung sliding. So that's a rule of finding. If you find and see lung sliding with confidence at that probe location, it rules out pneumothorax with confidence at that probe location. You just got to make sure you get that probe. And uh, Orrin uh, alluded to this earlier with that study uh, out of Korea. You need to get that probe to the most sensitive spot where air will accumulate so we don't miss small volume pneumothoraces that could become a problem mm. over time. So you're saying even though it's a small volume, it's like, who cares? That could actually become a problem. Absolutely. Mm. Could become a problem over time. So Tracking. make sure you check. Yep. Make Tracking. sure you check that most sensitive site in that patient, and we'll talk about that. Something else that rules out pneumothorax are B lines. If you see B line, which is decreased air at the lung surface, in other words, that visceral pleura, the fact that you're seeing it, that means there's no air between the parietal pleura, visceral pleura, i.e. no pneumothorax. So if you see a B line at that probe location, that rules out pneumothorax. However, you won't often have B lines at the most sensitive sites to rule out small pneumothoraces. However, CERN, if you had to go back in time to the creator, Creator of animals. Hi, my name is Cern Boysen. What would you do differently to help us diagnose pneumothorax? Or uh, it's a good point. I mean, it is pretty neat to see a beeline rules out pneumothorax because you can see it. Mm -hmm. So what would I do? At the most sensitive spot that I could actually put the probe, I would put one single beeline at that location in every single cat and dog. So you go back to the creator of animals and of all the potential wishes ever possible, is ask for a beeline at the That'd most be freaking cool. Mm -hmm. One beeline Fair. at the most caudal dorsal site yeah. and at the widest point of the chest. So I got all my bases covered regardless of patient position. I, I see. That's a big ask, I think. All right. But now, if pneumothorax can't be ruled out with beelines and absent lung sliding, we have to confirm its presence, right? If these things are present, then it rules in a pneumothorax. What are they? Yeah. So if our patient is unstable, trauma, respiratory distress, you think it's in trouble and you don't see obvious lung sliding, I would do thoracocentesis exactly. right then and there. Immediately. But if your patient's not in the process of trying to die and you have a bit of time yep. and you're not confident that that lung sliding truly was or wasn't present because it can be difficult to assess sometimes, yep. we're going to look for rule in findings. Yes. That is the lung point yep. and the abnormal curtain sign. The abnormal curtain sign. Okay. Absolutely. And there are two ones that we're going to look at, the double curtain sign and asynchronous. So, what is our preferred protocol to rule in or rule out confirmed pneumothorax? You know what? Honestly, CERN, I have trouble calling this a protocol. I'll be honest. And the reason why is we're really emphasizing here no memorization, no rib counting, right? And we are essentially using the natural borders that we're going to find with ultrasound, right? The natural borders using ultrasound to find the most sensitive spots. And we have to think about the pathology and where it's going to go. So I got to ask you, where's air going to go? First of all, sternal standing patients. So air will go to the most gravity independent spot in a standing patient. That's the most caudal dorsal site. You didn't memorize that. So then the next step is just to find the natural borders of pleural space and lung using ultrasound. Let's show how we do that. What is step one? So make sure you start over lung and we'll do this in a matter of seconds, but it's a, uh, you know, patient's unstable. You're a little bit panicked. You're not sure where the uh, lung starts or ends. Just start behind the front limb, halfway up the thorax. Okay, now you order. know you're more than likely to be over lung because if you're not, something is really, really wrong in that patient. Yeah, so that's essentially our cranial border. It's not the true cranial border of pleural space and lung. It's as far cranial as you can go. So you start there. And this is what it looks like. Absolutely. So we put the probe on right behind that front limb. You can see we're about halfway up the thorax, marker towards the head, and we look for the bat sign. That's right. So let's talk about that bat sign. The bat sign is, again, pattern recognition. All of this, when the probe is perpendicular to the ribs, we trace the two rib shadows up. The first bright white line below those rib shadows is the pleural line. And why is that important? And that's because everything we look for in point of care off when we're looking at the lungs, arises from this pleural line. So you got to find that pleural line. First white line below the ribs that joins the rib shadows. Now, we have rib shadows because ultrasound can't go through bone. Correct. And that's the easiest thing to find. If you look here, you see the rib shadows, you trace it up, it ends at the proximal rib. 
chase it up, ends at the proximal rib. So that is the wings of our bat in the bat sign. That's right. And when we assess this, we assess the entire image, not just what's between the ribs. Correct. As in people, they look between two ribs in our veterinary patients because we have such variation in size. We measure it across the entire ultrasound window. Now, I got to ask you something. All right. So we have the wings of the bat. The body of the bat is going to be that pleural line. Ultrasound has two natural enemies, bone and air. So wait a minute, but there's air in lung. So we can't actually see the lung in our LP patients, but it is interesting to note if the ultrasound beam comes down and is reflected, 99.9% .9 of that beam is reflected from a soft tissue air interface and the lungs against the chest wall, then we can't see beyond the lung surface. We need to look for indirect ways to know where the lung surface is. And that's why we find the pleural line because in healthy animals, the lung should be up against the pleural line. So the whole point of the bat sign is to find that pleural line. <laughs> Maybe I can ask Roderick to edit that out afterwards. Why? What's wrong with that? <laughs> this is a professional recording with thousands of people watching from around. Okay. What, what's moving on? What, look at look at my goggles. They're cool. <laughs> uh-huh. No? Yeah. Keep I think telling you should write them during a talk. Okay. So again, the whole point of the bat sign is to help you, the clinician, find that pleural line because lung is full of air, right? And air can't go through, or the ultrasound beeps can't go through air. So we're looking at the pleural line more importantly because all sonographic signs are going to arise from that pleural line. Absolutely. So all we got to do is trace the ribs up till you hit the rib shadow, follow it up to the rib, and then look for the first white line below the rib that joins the rib shadows. That's the pleural line. That forms our bat sign. That's our pattern recognition to find that pleural line. That's right. Because lung ultrasound is a surface imaging, imaging technique. Exactly. So very, very important. So step one was starting over lung right at that cranial border. Step two, we're going to go find the cauda border before going to the cauda dorsal. And what's that border called? And that is our curtain sign. So we're going to show you how we find that. We put the probe on the thorax. It is halfway up the chest with the marker towards the head. You see that again here. We've got our bat sign and then we jump a rib at a time caudally until we start to slide off the lung onto the abdomen. You can just see it coming in on the right side of the image here. We've got this vertical edge artifact that is our curtain sign. All right. right. So when identified, we see that curtain sign before we do anything else. So we start over long, we slide back, takes about two seconds. We hit that curtain sign. We assess that as normal or abnormal. So wait, it's not just a caudal border. It has some potential clinical significance. Absolutely. And I'd say the majority of times now I diagnose my pneumothoraces off an abnormal curtain sign because I find it easier to do than look for lung sliding. So I need a little more help. Please don't make a comment about that. I know what you're going to say. We wrote this book here on the left, essentially just to help me. <laughs> this is correct. Uh, so you can tell then it's very basic. It's very uh, like building blocks, like a child learning to uh, QR codes, stack videos. Uh, yep. So if you look at our uh, our image here, we got an ultrasound probe. We've got uh, a patient uh, that we have the probe half over lungs, half over the abdomen. And on the left where we're lung, the ultrasound beam comes down, it hits the rib, and we get rib shadow. Mm -hmm. The ultrasound beam comes down, it hits air-filled lung, it bounces back to the probe. So that's what we get on the left side where we're over lung. That's right. On the right side, we got the ultrasound beams also hitting that rib over here and bounces back, can't go through, and then also hits this portion. This is soft tissue, which means those ultrasound beams can go through. So that's very interesting, CERN, because what that creates is a vertical line artifact that moves to and fro with respiration. Absolutely. You can see it here. This is uh, where the lung ends in the costophrenic recess overlying the soft tissues of the abdomen. So the abdomen is on the right, the lungs on the left, and we get this vertical edge artifact that moves back and forth. Inspiration, expiration, inspiration, expiration. Very cool. That's our caudal border. That's our curtain sign. That's what it should look like. That's right. And that's not the diaphragm. That is not the diaphragm. Uh, that is actually a vertical edge artifact. The diaphragm, if you look closely enough in this video, is actually this little black line mm -hmm. right here. Curves. So it's along the costophrenic recess. And as soon as it curves away from the chest wall, what's overlying it? Air-filled lungs or creates this Therefore, line artifact. Therefore, we can't see it. Yeah. Okay. So I, I, I'm seeing this normal curtain sign. Why do we have abnormal curtain sides? I don't understand. Is that such a thing? It is. What is this? What is this? Come on. Focus, focus, diagnostic guessing game. Not guessing. That's the whole point of point of care ultrasound is to take away the guessing. 
we're going to put the probe on and we're going to see, and you can uh, uh, refer to this study if you wish, it's the normal or abnormal. And if it's abnormal, is it a double or an asynchronous? It's not a guessing game. That's the whole reason we put the probe on is to eliminate guessing. So much more fun and adventurous. Okay, so we have normal here. What do we see? First of all, we see one vertical edge artifact only. Absolutely. So you can see that here. This is normal. And if you look closely, don't overlook the other things. You see lung sliding mm -hmm. along the pleural line, yep. a vertical edge, inspiration, expiration. That yep. is a normal curtain sign. That's right. Never disappears. And on inspiration, moving away, expiration coming back. Okay. Now, here's an example. Wait, what? Whoa, whoa, wait, what? Wait, hold, sir, make it stop. Oron, make it stop. What's going on? Why, why is it coming in and out of the screen there? And this is what we call a double curtain sign. Why? Mm. Because we actually have two soft tissue air vertical edge artifacts. What? Yeah, it's actually kind of neat. If we actually freeze these images and I look on the left, there is the single yes. vertical edge artifact, Normal. air to soft tissue. Yep. If I look at the one on the right, I've got two vertical edge artifacts. And I've got air cranial to the lines and I've got air caudal to the line. Okay. And what actually is happening here is that soft tissue is breaking into an area of pneumothorax. Oh. So I've got air soft tissue on the left. I've yeah. got air soft tissue air on the right. Whoa. Okay. That's really freaky. So that's why it's coming in and out. We're calling it a double curtain sign because it's got two vertical edges that are coming and going. You know what, Cern? Again, we love pattern recognition, right? Absolutely. I think we should change this from double curtain sign to the peekaboo sign. Peekaboo, come and go. Peekaboo. It's actually, if it helps you remember it, that's a good descriptor. There it is. You can sort it. You, you don't see the, uh, and if I actually stop, if I actually stop and we actually play this in slower motion, there's no soft tissues visible. Boom, they break in. They disappear. They break in. They disappear. So this is soft tissues breaking into pneumothorax. This is a double curtain sign. We only see this with a pneumothorax. That's really cool. So all I did here is my patient's sternal standing. I went from my cranial border, cauda border, whoa. And I saw this abnormal curtain sign. I have a pneumothorax. Absolutely. All right. Now there's other ones like we've talked about. We've got normal on the left. And then there's this other strange Walden called the asynchronous curtain sign. You're going to have to help the audience here. So again, we know that for the normal curtain sign, everything is moving in sync, right with respiration. Absolutely. So my patient breathes in. I see here that we got the kidney. It moves caudal. Uh -huh. What else moves caudal with it? The vertical edge artifact. Yep. They don't move at exactly the same rate, but they move mm -hmm. in the same direction in the same phase of respiration. Yep. Exactly. And don't forget to also look because you can see lung, lung sliding. sliding here. Yep. I come over and look at this guy here. And again, if I'm watching this, I'll put my marker here, the finger, my Whoa. patient breathes in, the it's, little vessel here that you can see in the spleen. It's the opposite. It's moving caudal. Oh my goodness. Which way does the vertical edge Whoa. move? Where's it going? It moves cranial. So these move away from each other during the phases of respiration. So they are in opposite directions. And just to reiterate that fact, you see we got the red line here. Everything's yeah. moving caudally in the phase of respiration. On the right, we put that red line. Well, before we do that, I really think we should change the name because I There's think- There's the red line. What, well, look at it. I think it makes sense. Look at it. Since it's going the opposite direction, it looks like an accordion. <laughs> Live the pocus. Pocus should not be in here. Although I guess if you do, uh, it helps you remember that it's moving away from and towards each other during the respiratory phases, and it helps you, then I guess that accordion polka, you know, sign could work as well. You know what? Oran told me he's going to bring this back to the human ER and, and say polka to live. I'm just saying you, you should get on. I board. might bring my accordion to work actually and just try that. <laughs> That'd be perfect. All right. Mm -hmm. So again, this is all done in seconds. When cranial border, caudal border, patient's journal standing, we went to the highest point of the chest, the caudal dorsal border. All right. So we're going to go to the caudal dorsal border. How do we do that then? So we hit the uh, curtain sign. If that looks normal, we can go dorsal along that, assessing it until we slide off of the lung. So mm -hmm. here you go. We're at the curtain sign. We're going up. There's the pleural line. Still visible, still visible, going up, and now it's gone. It's in muscles. the lumbar, sub yeah. sublumbar muscles, hypaxia muscles. Now we come back down, do we just see it? Now we've used our borders. We've used our uh, sonographic landmarks to help us get to the most caudal dorsal site, That's which right. is the most sensitive spot. And you know what the brilliant part is? Again, no memorizing, no rib counting, and also take into account different patient sizes, right? They're not all going to have the caudal dorsal uh, site at the same place. Nope. 
And if they have an abdominal mass, they've got fluid, they're pregnant patients, they may actually shift that border cranially. Mm -hmm. So here we go. We start at that spot, halfway up the chest, mid thorax. Then we slide back the curtain sign, assess it. If it looks normal, follow it up along that curtain sign till the pleural line disappears, come back down till you'll just see it and look for lung sliding at the most sensitive spot with 100% confidence in a standing or sternal patient. So thinking about lung sliding, let's come back. Again, this is a bit of review from our 2021 Clarius talk, which you can find um, pretty, uh, pretty readily. Just a bit of revision for those who had anatomy a long time ago. I know for CERN, it was about in the 1800s when he went to vet school. We have a parietal pleura and a visceral pleura. There's a little bit of fluid in between them, but you can't see them and you certainly can't see the two pleura on ultrasound. So how do we know the lung is in contact with the chest wall? All right, so exactly like you said, it's unfortunate, but ultrasound's not sense enough to show them separated. They show up as a single white line, we call the pleural line. So how do we know that the lung is against the chest wall? Well, if we can find that pleural line using the bat sign, we can now look at that pleural line and say, do you see a back and forth shimmer? Mm -hmm. A uh, back and forth glimmer along that uh, pleural line. If you see a shimmer, it tells you two things. One, your lung is against the chest wall. Yes. Because that's what's creating the shimmer. It's the lung sliding along the inside of the chest wall. Yes. That's that lung sliding that creates the shimmer. Yes. So the lung, to see that shimmer, it tells you the lung has to be against the chest wall. That's right. And the lung has to move. That's so right. you have to have your patient breathe. Those are your two criteria to see lung sliding, lung against the chest wall, and then the lung moving, because that's what creates the sliding, which creates the shimmer. That's your lung sliding. So when we see the shimmer, we know that the lung is against the chest wall. Therefore, we do not have a pneumothorax. You know, it's sometimes really hard to imagine that shimmer, but I think, and this is going to be a shameless plug to my DJ skills. It's coming up right now. Um, Oron said he was going to buy my first CD. I haven't sold the CD yet, but well, I'm you not know. surprised. You um, not but you know, if you look at water coming out of a sink, right? It really looks like that, right? If you just look at that water just coming down, you know, up and down, you see it. Look at that. Oosh, oosh, oosh. So oosh, I will say oosh, it, the water oosh, moving is a oosh, good analogy. Oosh, you don't really see oosh, the water move. Oosh, you see a shimmer that tells you it's moving. Uh -huh. Don't quit. Oosh. Don't quit your day job. Why? What's don't wrong? quit your day Whoa. job. Yeah, it's going to go work very well. Anyways, so that's something that we um, can look at and just another analogy. But now let's come back to Kira. We went from cranial border to cauda border. We're at the curtain sign. Normal or abnormal? All right, great question. So uh, we'll give the audience a second to look at this and make a decision. We've got started over long, we've slid caudally, and we're looking at the region of the curtain sign. And the question is, is this a normal curtain sign, an asynchronous curtain sign, or a double curtain sign? That's right. And this one here is a peekaboo double curtain sign. This is the point where we would stop and tap. That's right. And I think just we missed one video right before, and I apologize. As you went from the cranial border to the cauda border, we saw this. Ooh, a lot of beelines, probably those contusions we were talking about. Yeah, so we're going to come back to that, um, talking about beelines. But uh, we put the probe on at the cranial border there, saw some beelines, probably contusions. And that's a, that's a clue as well. Yep. If you think about that, you've got beelines, and as you slide caudal, the beelines suddenly disappear. You yep. see a double curtain sign. It suggests that you have moved into a region of pneumothorax. That's right. So if Kira was significantly dyspneic and tachypneic and you saw that, would you drop your probe and tap this dog right now? Absolutely, 100% I would. All right. So let's go ahead. And that is something we can do. Our T for therapy treatment, we can actually use point of care ultrasound for that. We can do a thoracocentesis. Absolutely. So this is the case. Uh, obviously, this isn't Kira. This is a cadaver that we're doing some practice work on. Mm -hmm. But if we see that pneumothorax, we will use our ultrasound guidance, whether it's um, I what just want to public service announcement. Just watch the kidney as you were going. No, again, you should not see the kidney in the thorax. You should always be careful for the kidney. So no. coming back to it, if you see pneumothorax or significant pleural effusion, it's causing uh, clinical signs of respiratory stress, then yes, we will do ultrasound guided thoracocentesis because there is some evidence on the human side that ultrasound guidance decreases our complications. Okay, let's remove that. It's kidney. A, Everybody's seen the risk. kidney enough. It's not a risk. The kidney, no, there's no, if you hit the kidney doing thoracocentesis, you should give up your DVM degree. All right. So pneumothorax, we figured it out. We were correct in our assessment based on the physical exam, right? We started on the right side. We were worried about pneumothorax. Perfect. We went and tapped that. So let's go ahead and move on. We already have a good idea that Kira has pulmonary contusions just from that right side, but we have a left side to assess as well. Absolutely. And we saw them on the right. So now we're going to do the left. And again, how do we do this one? 
basically, once we've got to that caudal site, we're going to check the dorsal, the middle, and the ventral thirds of the thorax mm -hmm. using our borders in an S-shaped pattern. That's we'll right. That. And that's all it is. It's border to border to border scanning. Don't forget to include the sub -xiphoid. Great region also to look for lung and pleural space pathology. So here we are. We're at the caudal dorsal site, removing one rib at a time, looking for B lines or consolidations. Absolutely. And we got an image of those at the top there. You're looking for vertical white lines or you're looking for what looks like tissue at the lung mm -hmm. surface. Not seeing any in this dog. That's good because these are a healthy volunteer. Yeah. We're moving back now to that curtain sign in the mid thorax, not seeing any B lines or consolidations. We get to that curtain sign. We're going to follow it ventrally until we yep. put the heart and the diaphragm in the same window. Yep. So here we are scanning towards the uh, pericardio diaphragmatic window. That's right. There it's coming in right there. We didn't see any fluid. We didn't see any B lines. We didn't see any consolidation. Now we're going to turn the probe at this location parallel to the ribs with the marker dorsal. That's right. So we're at the lowest point of that thorax. We're again pretending this patient is sternal standing, right? We got to tell the audience that. And turning the probe parallel really increases that sensitivity for finding small effusions, right? Absolutely. And we go up and down so we can check ventral lung pathology versus ventral pleural space pathology because the two are different. And you pull the limb forward and you can tuck that probe under the axilla to expand the region you're looking at as well. So we know that a couple beelines here and there are normal, right? No issue with that, right? But the thing is, is when you start seeing a lot of beelines, that's when things become problematic. And I don't know about you, CERN, but I really, really think we should change a light. I mean, look at them. Look at them dancing. Two. I am your father. Okay, dude, dude, stay on target. Stay on target. Uh, the point here is occasional beelines can be normal. One like you see in this animal. Dude, I just said, stay. Look, I even wore my shirt to keep you even more. Stay on target. So one beeline occasionally is normal. All Perfect. Right. They're vertical white lines. They originate at the lung surface. Oh, great. So they originate at the lung surface. Very important. And if you see them, as we talked about, B lines originating at the pleural line rule out pneumothorax, but at that probe location. All right. So what else do we have in terms of criteria? Gotcha. That was a tough one, dude. Why didn't you, you gotta work on that? You should have rehearsed. So they move with the lung surface, they move with the pleura. So they are in sync. This is true. B lines are in sync with lung sliding as opposed to some other vertical artifact we tend to see. All right. They usually extend to the far field, not always, but most of the time they go very, very far. And if A lines were present, they obliterate them like lightsabers. All right. So those are the criteria, our five criteria we use to assess beeline. So let's look at Kiri here. We've got our, uh, I'll stop. We're going to look at two sites. What do you think? On the right, do you see vertical white dancing in sync beelines? I see a ton of vertical dancing bright white beelines. All right. Now on the left, this is multiple spots. We have the Ooh. dorsal, the middle, multiple regions on the left. What do you think? Well, there's areas that are just white. Is that bad? All right. So if their beelines get bad enough, they start to converge, they start to coalesce, and we call that white lung. So mm -hmm. this is worsening of the contusions, worse aeration at the periphery of the lung, but still only seeing artifact through B lines that are consolidated and individual. Well, at these probe locations, we have lung sliding. I think that's pretty clear. We see the dancing B lines, right? Do we have pneumothorax? No, the fact that I'm seeing those B lines means at this probe location, I do not have a pneumothorax. Correct. So we had pneumothorax on the right side. We don't have it on the left. We go to the most caudal dorsal site on the left. We still see B lines there. We do not have a pneumothorax on the left side, but we do have significant pulmonary contusions because our lung surface has too many B lines, decreased aeration, and then they hit by car. If we see increased B lines until proven otherwise, yep. that's going to be pulmonary contusions. You know what's interesting though, CERN, as we were scanning Kira, I got the impression that sometimes I was going her ribs and she was in pain. Could I even diagnose rib fractures of ultrasound? So that's interesting. If you look at the human literature, there's actually some evidence to suggest it is more sensitive than radiographs what? of diagnosing rib fractures. No. Uh, so that led us to do a study. And if you look at our normal here, uh, this is our rib mid thorax. You can see this white line. That's the rib rib and long axis over the center of the rib with the uh, rib shadowing. 
And if you slide up to the dorsum, you can actually follow the rib in to see where it joins the vertebrae. So this is actually where so the rib curves. Parallel to the rib. Parallel, the rib. parallel yeah. and over the, the center rib. of the rib. Yeah. And you come down, this is the rib here. And you see yeah. it's all one smooth cortex. So what we're doing is looking for discontinuity in the cortex. And if I show you this one here and said, take a guess, which one has the normal cortex? Which one has the abnormal step in the cortex? Um, the one with the massive step down? Exactly. So the one on the right, is a rib fracture. Interesting. So we actually then said, you know what? How good is ultrasound at diagnosing rib fractures? We did a cadaver study at the University uh, of uh, Calgary with one of our vet students. And you can see we compared it to a board certified radiologist interpreting radiographs that had fractures in the same animals we scanned with lung ultrasound. Our sensitivity was 83 and 99.7% wow. with ultrasound. 82 and 99 percent with a board certified radiologist interpreting radiographs that's impressive so you can see it's exactly the same and this was with a combined expert in pocus yep. and a student in pocus and an expert uh radiologist and a novice student in radiology so you can see that the results are exactly the same and extremely high to yep. diagnose rib fractures right so in summary team pleural space and lung ultrasound Four pathologies you can look for to pleural space, pleural fusion, pneumothorax. Increased beelines with that abnormal lung surface and consolidations with the speculation now, because that was only a cadaver study. We'd have to extend it to live animals. Are we good at diagnosing rib fractures in our veterinary patients? That's right. Now? So Kira, how did Kira do? So Kira did excellent. Uh, we did have pulmonary contusions, as you know, in rib fractures. We provided analgesia, oxygen, supportive care for those rib fractures. And we did have the pneumothorax. We tapped that with the ultrasound guided thoracocytesis. We did have to tap it three times yep. in about a 36-hour period. If we had to tap it a fourth time, I probably would have thrown in a chest tube. But we tapped it three times, each time a little bit uh, longer after the preceding one. And after three, we never had to tap again. And eventually, Kira did go home with you. That's awesome. And on that team, that concludes our case. A huge thank you so much. We're going to turn it back to Orm. Great. Thanks, guys. Uh, before we get to the Q&A, please make sure to stay with us to the top of the hour. And we'll probably go a bit over uh, getting into the Q&A because there's a lot of questions. And we want to make sure we field as many of those as we can. Uh, we're going to hand it over to Shelly Gunther for a quick demo. Great. Thank you. I don't have a lot of time here, but I think what, I'll, what I want to do is just demonstrate the, um, the rib scanning, because uh, that was very cool. And I'll just put a little bit of put on her here. And so I am using the linear scanner here. This is the L7 VET scanner. And if I just um, scan like we were doing a lung scan, and I'll part the fur here, um, what we would see is the rib shadows. And, and Everybody can see that all right. Yeah, okay, good. Good. So so well here's done. our here's our rib shadows and our nice. pleura here. And we think I'm actually getting the curtain sign, yeah, I believe. Right totally here, so. the curtain yeah. sign. <laughs> and Mabel does not have a pneumothorax based on that uh, yay, lovely curtain sign. Yay. Good job. Good. Now, if I'm just going to look for a rib fracture, we would find kind of that point where she's tender. I'm going to rotate my scanner 90 degrees. Just right. staying on this rib here. That's and it. it's very yep. bright, very linear. Um, and then you can just kind of follow that to the tender point, I guess. Is that is that right? Absolutely correct. And we it. need to look for a bend or a step, a discontinuity in the cortex. Right. And the one thing, because you're doing a nice job of it here, the one thing that you have to be careful of is you don't drop off the rib into the intercostal space because the lung surface in long uh, acts can look look right there can look very yeah. similar to a rib. So that All is right. what you have to be aware of, but you're actually Excellent. on the actual rib there versus the uh, intercostal versus space. The intercostal and space there. which is here. Because cool. they do look yeah. very similar. So that's uh, one of the challenges. But great job. That's exactly yeah. what yeah, we do. Thanks. Thanks. With, and that's a nice Excellent. view with the linear. That's a beautiful image. Uh, yeah. The proximal cortex of that rib and no discontinuity. Very nice. Perfect. All right. I think we'll uh, give Mabel a cookie and... Call it a day now. Just give me one no. second and Good I'll work. Good looking lungs, good looking curtain sign, good looking ribs. She'll be she'll be happy to hear about that. <laughs> nice, great. Thanks so much. Uh, so a reminder to stay with us to the top of the hour. And while we are about to get to our Q&A, uh, we need to be here for at least 15 minutes to qualify for a CE CPD credit. Um, the folks over at Clarius have a question for you with a poll that's an opportunity to learn more about their Clarius scanners. Uh, and we're going to hand it over to Shelly here. Uh, please keep filling the Q&A tab at the bottom as well. And we're going to get to those shortly.
Um, before we begin our live Q&A, uh, we hope you'll stay on with us to the top of the hour and we may go over a little bit because we have lots of questions, but we have a question for you. This poll is an opportunity to learn more about our third generation Clarius ultrasound scanners for your veterinary practice. So please complete this poll to let us know if we can provide further information about Clarius HD3 vet scanners and click on as many options um, that apply. And Clarius is available over 90 countries and pricing and availability may vary by region. So feel free to request a quote and some pricing for your region. And while you take a minute to participate in this poll, I'd like to tell you about our Clarius VET HD3 scanners for the highest definition wireless ultrasound imaging for small, medium and large animals. The Clarius C7 HD3 micro convex which our guests use today. It's specifically designed for clinical imaging in small and medium animals like cats and dogs. Now each scanner is designed to deliver image quality and frame rates only found in traditional ultrasound systems, but at a fraction of the cost, representing about 85% savings. Clarius is also wireless with a zero footprint, which makes it ultra portable for scanning animals anywhere they are the vet clinic to the homes or out in the field. You'll have no wires getting in the way or startling the animals. And it also makes it much faster to clean and disinfect. And only Clarius delivers wireless scanners that come with an ecosystem that includes a free app for your iOS or Android device with free updates as soon as they become available. And with membership, Clarius Cloud is available to save and manage unlimited exams and create reports. Your membership includes in-app Clarius classroom videos with experts like today's guests, as well as onboarding with a Clarius clinician to build your ultrasound scanning skills. And Clarius Live delivers one-click telemedicine if you'd like to share live scanning with a colleague for advice or just want to get a second opinion. We have a total of three scanners for a veterinary practice. We've got the C3 convex vet for larger animals like sheep and horses, and the L7 linear for animal MSK imaging, often used for equine applications, or like I showed you today for imaging the ribs. Now with increased ultrasound billings, you'll see a rapid return on your Clarius HD3 vet scanner. So we'll close off the poll now in three, two, one. Thank you. And if you ask for more information, we will get back to you in the coming week. So let's get to our live Q&A session. And uh, Dr. Frankel, I'll ask you to moderate, please. Sure. Yeah. Uh, let's see. So there are so many questions. I'm not even sure where yeah. to start. Um, I never know if that's a good thing or, or we just, <laughs> we didn't make any sense. Yeah. One question is, do you ever do dynamic scanning? So with a thoracocentesis, um, are you looking for, are you kind of re-examining them and then checking to make sure the double curtain kind of goes away or that it's at least getting smaller? Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, so when we uh, do our uh, thoracocentesis, we'll check afterwards. So we're looking for a lung point. We can actually get a feel for where along the thorax that lung point is occurring between the sternum and the dorsum when they're standing. And then once we've tapped them, we can check to see if it's moved more dorsally, which it should. We can also follow the curtain sign because what should happen is that double curtain sign, once we tap it, should turn back to a normal curtain sign. And only above the areas where we tap, where we may still have a little bit of pneumothorax persistent, will we still see abnormal curtain signs? So we look to see that the abnormal abnormal curtain sign is moving up dorsally, and we're also looking to see uh, at what level normal becomes abnormal along that curtain sign. So absolutely, we do serial evaluations for both the lung point and the abnormal curtain signs. Yep. This comes up uh, almost every webinar we do. People want to know what meds you're using um, on your sick patients, you know, to try and get the scan. Uh, can you just say something to that? Yeah, for sure. I mean, opioids, obviously we're worried about pain and anxiety in this patient, but specifically pain. We know it's a hit by car patient and definitely had some rib fractures. So opioids are, you know, relatively safe, right? You know, so I think knowing the dosages and which opioids, um, you know, at the practices, the, the teaching hospitals we're at, they tend to have been using a lot of methadone, 0.2, 0.4 makes per keg. Um, fentanyl, if needed be, you know, the nice thing is you can titrate it up and down pretty quickly, right? So especially with those patients, and as long as you're monitoring and doing other things for perfusion at the same time. Yeah, absolutely. And the big thing on the opioids is the reason we use them a lot in the ER settings because they are re fairly respiratory cardio sparing, but we can also reverse them. Reverse. If we screw up, yeah. we want to be able to take that back in our patients that may deteriorate. So we do have things ready to intubate and capture an airway when we yep. give our opioids in case they do go into a uh, apneic or respiratory arrest state, have things ready to intubate. 
and have things ready to reverse should the patient uh, do something you didn't anticipate. Mm -hmm. So hmm. that's another reason that we really like to use the opioids uh, as our analgesic and also our anxiolytic. Uh, they have a double purpose. That's right. Yep. And uh, we tout in these webinars also, you know, the ability of ultrasound to kind of capture the animal, get the images you need in the patient of maximal comfort of the patient. Um, can you speak a bit to modifying the technique in standing patients versus if they're in lateral decube? Yeah, for sure. I mean, if they're in lateral, then again, it's all the same principles. Really what we're emphasizing is no memorization. Patient is in lateral, air rises. So if you're going to look for a pneumothorax, you're going to go to the highest point of the chest. Patient is in sternal standing, air rises again. So you're going to go to the highest point. And what we're emphasizing is if you know that logic, that clinical reasoning, and think about ultrasound borders, patient positioning, where pathology is going to go, then it's it's going to become intuitive, right? You never have to pull up a reference book and be like, oh, it's this rib or that rib, et cetera, et cetera. You're going to be able to find it. Why I you found a balloon randomly in your uh, office My two-year-old, don't so pop it. I'm not going to pop it, but I'm going to show you. If this patient's in lateral, I'll put a little X without popping it. You're going to pop it. No, I'll put a little X. That's where the air would go if my patient was in a sternal or standing position. Now I flip him into lateral. There you go. You see that the, uh, the, the spine is sitting here. Yeah. And where does the air go? Uh, Widest yeah. point of the chest. So that is how uh, we think about it. It's not rocket science. All you gotta do is think, what pathology am I looking for? And where does it go? Air rises to the most non-gravity dependent regions. Make sure you put the probe at that site and that will change if they're in lateral yeah. or sternal or standing. And that's what always concerns us about rigid protocols that emphasize put the probe here always, right? Yeah, you might catch most or some of the pneumothoraces. I don't know some of the pathology, but there's no doubt you're gonna miss them. Yeah, because it changes and you can't use the same spot for standing versus a lateral yep. recumbent patient. Exactly. It's not rocket science, it's veterinary science. <laughs> <laughs> I love it. There you go. Uh, cats, same deal. Cat hit by car. Yep. Same, same, same stuff. stuff. Yep. Yep. On that note, lungs are lungs. That's right. Lungs are nuts. Great. And what I want to uh, do maybe a human scan in a reverse position so the air goes up to the diaphragm because you guys do them in... Uh, in more of a uh, supine position, right? When you scan for pneumothorax? Yeah, the human animal likes to lay on their back uh, in the, <laughs> <laughs> when they're in maximal distress. Yeah, so we're uh, we're kind of looking up here, you know, top of the chest, because that's wow. the same principle, where the eye arises. Right, exactly. very cool, very cool. Yeah. Uh, okay, I'm gonna squeeze in maybe one more. Um, you know, these lung protocols where you're looking for the B lines, you wanna say anything about kind of differentiating between medical or trauma? I mean, you know, you have the traumatic patient. Do you ever, how do you approach the patient? Maybe you don't have the history of trauma, you don't know what happened. And if you see findings, um, where do you integrate the, the trauma and the undifferentiated patient? I guess is maybe how I can capture that question. Uh, I'm not sure I'm not trying to understand the answer. that, but yeah. I, I think the question is, uh, can we find B lines in a non-trauma patient and what do they represent in that population of animals? Yes. Uh, yeah, I think if you, you have a patient who you don't know, what I'm trying to capture in this question oh. is the patient you don't know why they're in distress I gotcha. um, and you see B lines, like how do you differentiate? Is this medical or trauma uh, contusion uh, versus maybe what's the differential? That's, that's going to be challenging. I mean, there's no doubt, right? I mean, you need that history. It's just like radiographs, right? If you take radiographs and you see an alveolar interstitial pattern, um, and you're like, well, what, what happened to this patient, right? Of course, you're going to look for the clues, bruising on the body. Um, if, if you see evidence of a pneumothorax, you know, and beelines, you know, I would suggest that's probably hit by car in that patient because, you know, if it was just a bulla, you probably shouldn't get beelines, et cetera. Yeah, so we're definitely going to look for other evidence of external trauma, so abrasion, yep. bruises, uh, injury to the sclera, fractured teeth, and then the cats will often see worn nail beds because yes. they uh, tend to run on the pavement and it takes the nail beds down. Uh, so we always look at the nail beds in our feline patients to see if we've got unwitnessed trauma. Uh, more classic presentation would be cat goes out in the evening, owner finds it on the on the front step at noon the next day, mm -hmm. and it comes in and we've got beelines. So then we're looking for other evidence of injury in that patient because it can be very difficult to differentiate uh, beeline origin. Anything that decreases air in the lungs at the periphery of the lungs is going to cause beelines, whether it's uh, cells, whether it's fluid, yep. whether it's atelectasis. Mm -hmm. So differentiating the types of beelines can be very challenging, and it's more the history and other physical exam findings yep. that'll lean us towards trauma versus uh, non-trauma right. causes. Mm -hmm. 
And maybe I'll refer viewers to other webinars talking about lung ultrasound and how to interpret those findings in a more medical context. Yeah, 100%. Absolutely. Great, great. Well, I want to respect people's time. We're already uh, about five minutes over. So um, we will be following up with the remainder of these questions that we couldn't get to. Um, Shelly, do you want to take us home here? Yes, I will. Thank you very much to our wonderful speakers and thanks, Dr. Frankel. Um, uh, if we didn't get to your questions, we will follow up with you by email in the coming week. And again, you'll receive a copy of the webinar recording as well by email this week. So please complete our closing survey to give us your feedback so we can continue to bring you great educational content like today. So I'd like to conclude by thanking again, Dr. Boyson and Dr. Shaloub, and also thanks to Dr. Frankel and Mabel. And of course, thank you to all of you for attending. And I hope you had as much fun as we did today. Keep on scanning. Bye-bye. Cheers. Bye, everybody. Thanks, everyone. Bye.